Palantir is one of the newer sweethearts of Wall Street bets and retail investors worldwide, and for good reason. It's a cheap stock and a polarizing, highly secretive business whose majority of market share comes from selling software to the government's defense and intelligence sectors. Palantir was founded by the contrarian Peter Thiel and features a mysterious, borderline cultish CEO in Alex Karp, whose habits and work routines and willingness to speak up about the status quo makes him a radical compared to others in Silicon Valley. But beyond the memes, let's take a look at how Palantir operates as a business. Along the way, we can learn about just about how much money there is to be made selling to agencies like the CIA and how much profit there can be as a company that sells software to the greater military industrial complex. So Palantir sells two software products. The first product is called Gotham, which is a tool built for analysts at defense and, and intelligence agencies. Gotham helps analysts find patterns in large data sets. One of the early inspirations for Gotham was that in the initial invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, in the early 2000s, U.S. soldiers had to map the intelligence they got out of insurgents and roadside bombers by hand on pen and paper. Gotham is designed to address that need by allowing analysts to put all their data together from confidential informants to intelligence reports and then find the patterns and visualize these large data sets within a computer. These same challenges of making sense of large data sets and finding patterns exist not just in the defense and intelligence sector, but also in the private sector. Palantir's second product is Foundry, which is a version of Gotham that's designed for the private sector, for private companies that are not military, government, or intelligence. Yet despite having these two products, Palantir is a very military and intelligence-centric business. It holds a very different philosophical view from regular tech companies. Palantir makes it very clear that they have no business in collecting, mining, or selling data. All the data that customers bring and use within Palantir's products are self-contained, whether it's Foundry or Gotham, all that data belongs to the customer. Palantir is focused on helping these companies or organizations centralize these large data sets from ex their existing tools and doing analysis on this entire bucket together. Palantir also has a very unique design when it comes to their software. Most tech companies today have a rip and replace walled garden mindset. Probably the most famous example of this is Apple. The goal of these modern tech companies is to get you to tear out what you already have today and use their software or hardware exclusively and then make it hard for you to switch back to your old tools if things get wonky with your new setup. Think like Google Chrome and Safari, iPhone and Android and so forth. But Palantir takes a very different view. Their software is designed and meant to integrate with existing legacy IT products. That means that whether you're a defense company, an intelligence agency, military, or a private company, you can maintain your key historic investments. You don't have to rebuild your entire data infrastructure and redo everything from scratch if you want to use Palantir's products. This is a really radical take compared to, say, Snowflake, as we covered in an earlier episode, where Snowflake's story is totally different. Snowflake's story is that your historic data and infrastructure is no good. You have to get on ours if you want to get anywhere. Palantir is an extremely unorthodox company, both in its structure and business from the numbers. Given its extreme focus on defense and intelligence, Palantir has a very small market to target as an enterprise software company, but they also have a larger upside on paper. Palantir only has 125 to 200 customers to date, but each customer on average spends about $5.6 million, which is massive. We can get a sense from just these numbers how lucrative and rich the American military industrial complex is. Since Palantir by nature is a politically charged business and its products are so sensitive, the company by design and intent only sells to the the U.S. and its allies. Regardless of your own personal views and political perspectives, there are really only a handful of intelligence and defense agencies in the West that fit under this view. In the U.S. alone, there are only 16 intelligence agencies, with the most well-known and well-funded ones today being the CIA, FBI, and the NSA. And it's not like these Western countries or even the U.S. we come up with new intelligence agencies all the time. It's been these 16 agencies for a very long period of time. If we compare Palantir to the mainstream enterprise software companies, even even the same ones that IPO'd in the same year as Palantir, you can see that the private sector is a totally different animal. For instance, Snowflake has over 3,000 customers with an average spend of $160,000. Datadog, which is another analysis and monitoring company, has 8,000 customers, but their average spend is only about $37,000. So Palantir's average customer, who spends $5.6 million as an intelligence agency, is spending 35 times more than your average private company. And so as Americans, even though we don't get the same 
exact visibility into the funding for America's intelligence agencies, the average 5.6 million spent on Palantir software should give you a sense for just how much of Americans taxpayers money is possibly allocated to the overall military industrial complex. Now Palantir's customer base is split 50-50 across both the public and the private sectors, but all reports so far indicate that public sector customers outspend the private sector customers. To me, where the numbers get really interesting is when we remove the political aspects and evaluate Palantir as a bare bones business. Palantir boasts an impressive top line performance going from 500 million in 2018 to now over 1 billion in gross revenue in just two years. And like most tech IPOs of the 2020s so far, Palantir is not a profitable company, but we've seen time and time again, tech companies are happy to incur present day losses to compound future profits. But something about the way that Palantir is allocating its costs today make the idea of profitability seem very far for this company. Palantir is making this calculated bet that the future of their business is not about expanding their software to the private sector, even if they claim that that's one of their strategic focuses. To me, the future of Palantir is about expanding and fully monopolizing the software of Western intelligence and defense communities. The American military industrial complex is so lucrative and selective that these agencies will always side with Palantir and have more than enough budget to keep Palantir fat and happy for generations to come. It's worth noting here that Palantir also has the insider advantage in defense and government and military sectors as Palantir as a company, its roots were in the CIA, as Palantir took on heavy funding and a tremendous amount of influence while they were building their product from the CIA in the early 2000s. When you look at Palantir's spend, there are some really noteworthy ways on how the company has structured itself and allocated its investments. For a company that's spent essentially over 18 years building and refining its products, you know, the same battle-tested software that it claims has gotten more robust over use in the Afghan and Iraq wars in the past decade, Palantir still spends more on R&D than any other Silicon Valley company in the world. Palantir spends about 51% of its revenue or 51 cents of every dollar it makes on engineers and designers to build and improve its product. For comparison, if we're also comparing, you know, mature tech companies, Apple spends about 7% of its revenue on R&D, Facebook spends 21% of its revenue on R&D, Microsoft spends 13, and Google spends about 15% of its revenue on R&D. But even if we constrain the comparison to other recently IPO tech companies that are also at the same stage as Palantir, Palantir's R&D is still record high. Snowflake, in comparison, only spends 40% of its revenue on R&D, Confluent spends 45%, and Datadog spends 35% of its revenue on R&D. Palantir has consistently spent 40 to 50% of its revenue every year in existence on R&D, not just in 2020. And there are a few possible reasons for this. The first is likely due to Palantir's stance about integrating its products with existing software. The US government has a lot of legacy software and hardware all throughout its systems and agencies. And we're still a country that still uses floppy disks to manage nuclear missiles. One can only imagine how outdated and archaic some of the other IT systems around the country are. It's an incredibly powerful sell for Palantir to walk into an intelligence or defense agency and say, hey, we'll work with you with everything you have today. Nothing's getting ripped out. Everything you're using today, you're keeping. Our products will only enhance everything that you've built so far. That alone is a really compelling sales pitch that no other tech company would make. And that's because the technical effort and engineering required for Palantir to integrate and customize its products to each government's IT systems and policies is an absolutely massive undertaking. Software and hardware that was built in the 70s and 80s that run a lot of the government systems today were simply not built for today's internet or tech standards, and in many cases were just never designed to evolve. Integrating Palantir's modern software into these environments and architecture is a huge and expensive engineering effort that makes Palantir operate more than just a software vendor. They're not just selling software. Palantir by effect become consultants as they're the ones that have to handle the technical implementation and integration details to demonstrate the value of their offerings in the public sector. Now this is a real double-edged sword. Even after 10 years of operating, the reality is that Palantir has to maintain this really expensive and high R&D investment and engineering account to make sure that their products can integrate and not just desktop computers in an old office, but to oil rigs and military Humvees and to battleships. At the same time, no other company has the pockets or connections that are as deep as Palantir to undertake these efforts politically and technically, which gives Palantir this unparalleled customer retention and service in the public sector. Given the high amount of customization and technical integration needed, given the high amount of customization and technical integration, Palantir sales cycles then take an average of an incredibly long six to nine months to close. 
But when these deals do close, the company pockets about $6 million on average. The only question remaining is, well, how much room is there for these deals to grow? Could this average deal size of $6 million be expected to grow over time or hold constant? And with the United States' formal exit from the Afghanistan war in 2021, would Western governments continue investing more in their defense and intelligence budgets, given that countries around the world have all observed what is the heavy cost of fighting real wars? These are all future-looking market questions about Palantir's potential potential that are really deeply lied to the political landscape rather than the economic one. It's difficult to see Palantir's products making inroads in the commercial data market when you have red hot fellow competitors like Snowflake and Databricks, who are companies that have spent billions of dollars themselves building a product and a muscle selling to the private enterprise. What's worth noting is that in the past two years with COVID, while there was a global economic contraction in the private sectors, there was actually an expansion. There was increased spending in the public sectors that Palantir capitalized on. In the past year, Palantir has taken the spotlight by winning big deals in the military and public sector. They signed an $823 million contract with the U.S. Army, a $90 million contract with Veteran Affairs, and then another $60 million with the National Institute of Health and the Department of Health for analyzing the spread of COVID. And so while critics have pointed out that governments may be conveniently using COVID as a cover to expand their greater visibility or monitoring of their citizens, I think we can all objectively agree that under the pandemic, governments around the world have all taken some very active roles in setting and enforcing behaviors in society. Palantir in general is riding on the big data trend just like Snowflake or Datadog or Databricks. But what's really unique to Palantir is that the company is riding on a bigger wind. It's riding on macro geopolitical trends more than it is riding on technical trends. And so despite intense public scrutiny, a lot of Western governments have continued to actively promote and invest in tech-driven governance. You know, things like preventative policing, public surveillance, facial recognition. These are all policies that will requ require a key strategic partner, and that partner right now is really Palantir. Palantir already has inroads at the federal government level and the local level with contracts with customers like the NYPD, the LAPD, and the Department of Homeland Security. The market opportunity is really there for Palantir to create and capture that value should these politics ever come and manifest into reality. Palantir overall is an unconventional company and even more unorthodox investment if you think about it from the perspective of a shareholder. But when you're investing in Palantir, you're not betting on a tech company, but you're rather betting on the continued permeance of the American military industrial complex and a greater and more active hands-on role in governments throughout the West.